Coming up on DTNS, Airbnb talks to the SEC. Hate speech policies have an impact online. And does the Golden State need a lift? This is the Daily Tech News for Thursday, August 20th, 2020 in lovely Cleveland, Ohio. I'm Rich Grappolino. From Oakland, California, I'm Justin Robert Young. And uh, I'm Roger Chang, the show's producer. Remember, you can always get the wider conversation on our expanded show, Good Day Internet. Uh, We were talking about uh, as seen on TV products, audio uh, editors, and all sorts of great stuff. And you can do that by becoming a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. But let's start out now with a few tech things you should know. DoorDash launched grocery delivery service, partnering with select grocery stores in California and across the Midwest. The company will deliver groceries from Smart and, uh, Smart and Final, Meyer, Fresh Time, and Hy-Vee with service available in Chicago, Cincinnati, Detroit, Indianapolis, Milwaukee, Los Angeles, Orange County, Sacramento, San Diego, and the Bay Area initially. DoorDash said the service will offer on-demand ordering rather than scheduling deliveries in set windows like other services and has over 10,000 grocery items that can offer one-hour delivery. Grocery delivery is also included as part of the Dash Pass, Pass subscription service. Taiwan's Ministry of Economic Affairs announced new regulations that would bar Taiwanese companies from selling Internet streaming services based in China, effective on September 3rd. The National Communications Commission said that this regulation would not ban the services in the the country, merely restricting Taiwanese companies from acting as sales agents for them. Google updated its Google Duo video call service to now offer captions on voice and video messages. Google will transcribe but not store the audio from the messages, and of course this can be toggled on and off in the messages settings. Volkswagen began production of its ID4 all-electric SUV at its factory in Zwickau, Germany. This is VW's second all-electric ID-branded vehicle, and its first ID vehicle slated to be produced and sold in China, Europe, and the U.S. Two factories in China will begin produ- uh, production of the ID4 later in 2020 with VW's factory in Chattanooga, Tennessee, scheduled to begin production in 2022. Sony released Imaging Edge Webcam, a Windows 10 app, which allows owners of Sony cameras to use them as webcams when connected over USB. 35 cameras are supported, including older mirrorless models like the original A7S and A7 II, both of which were originally released in 2014, as well as much more newer models like the last two models of the RX100, the RX0 models, and A6000 camera lines. Sony did not announce if the software would come to Mac OS. Adobe confirmed that users who updated Lightroom CC on iOS to version 5.4 may be missing photos and presets that were not synced to Adobe Cloud. And that missing data is, yipes, not recoverable. Adobe subsequently released version 5.4.1, which does not suffer the same data loss bug. It's unclear how widespread the data loss was or how many users were impacted. That hurts my heart to hear it. Uh, and finally here, Google updated the, or not finally here, <laughs> Google updated the support page for Android Auto, announcing that any phone running Android 11 can use Android Auto wirelessly. Google introduced the ability to connect Android Auto wirelessly back in 2018, but the feature has been limited to Pixel and Samsung Galaxy devices. Outside of the operating system, the only hardware requirement for a wireless Android Auto connection is the ability to connect to 5 gigahertz Wi-Fi networks. And finally, and finally, the (laughs) analysts at CounterPoint Research found that in the first half of 2020, the smartwatch market grew revenue 20%, even as shipments remained flat with 42 million devices. Apple continues to dominate, growing its revenue 8.2% and now accounting for 51.2% of the market. Garmin and Huawei both overtook Samsung with the second and third most market share, respectively. One in four smartwatches shipped in the first half features cellular connectivity, and 60% featured some form of heart monitoring. All right, let's get a little bit more into talking about Airbnb. They announced that it submitted a draft registration to the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission in advance of initial public offering. This would be their S-1 filing. The company did not disclose further financial information or say how many shares would be included in the IPO. I imagine all the information will be disclosed at a later date. Airbnb also announced a global ban on parties and events at its listings for health reasons, with a new property occupancy cap of 16 people on all future bookings that were remain in effect until further notice. Airbnb said 73% of listings had already banned parties in their house rules. I know this is something that Airbnb, the the health part of this specifically, has been something that they've been struggling with or at least trying to 
uh, uh, project that they are uh, trying to be active about um, this, making it uh, kind of very clear. Still, 16 people see already seems like th that's that's a that's a lot of people to be staying in Airbnb right now, right, Justin? Oh yeah, <laughs> I think that that's that is well. Thank you for doing something. I I believe some folks would say, although you are the manager of your own listing, so you could make it a more restrictive number. Uh, 16, I guess, is probably the upper limit for a bachelor party or a large family, a family reunion or something <laughs> like that. Uh, uh, you know, I, I guess you could you could see if you squint, uh, uh, you could you could imagine some sort sort of gathering at a large enough a venue for it. Even then, I would imagine that that's uncomfortable for a lot of Airbnb owners. But it really does raise a very interesting question. Since this is a transaction between the person renting and the person letting their house out, what role does the platform have in policing for health concerns in something as dangerous and more, to be cynical for a second, famous as COVID is? This isn't like an odd thing that happens every once in a while. Everybody knows about COVID. It's affected everybody. So, so what does Airbnb have to do specifically as they don't want that to be a major headline when they IPO? Well, and you can see that it took them six months to kind of figure out at least what this answer to that question is um, right now. And yeah, I, I mean, I imagine I have to imagine that they, you know, they ran some sort of algorithm that said, okay, of the number of, you know, party bookings that we've had, you know, anything over a certain amount, is, you know, I, I'm sure this is all backed up, hopefully by data and not just, I don't know, just because it sounds nice. I mean, Justin, just real quick, I, in terms of the timing of the IPO, uh, I think the initial impression was, man, Airbnb is really going to take it uh, to the chin here uh, with all the COVID lockdowns. But they've kind of had this, uh, not even a mini boom, but a substantial boom in business as people are trying to, you know, kind of do mini vacations and remote work is kind of the new thing. Um, does does the timing kind of work out that they can say, hey, look, our, all of our numbers are going to be up now for the past you know, two quarters or something like that, but only because we were down so much for maybe like Q1, Q2 or something like that. I think that it makes a lot of sense. <laughs> I know I know for, for my, my wife and I, we've been cooped up looking at these four walls. The idea after, you know, uh, obviously I have to, you know, focus on the election, but after that, the idea that we maybe ran out an Airbnb for like a month just to look at Another set of four walls. Uh, uh, that is very <laughs> exciting. I, I think that there's a lot of cooped up people that would like staycations and not to talk to people. And that's something that you can get with Airbnb that you might not be able to get with a uh, uh, with a with a hotel. Even if, if the idea of talking to somebody at the front desk worries you, uh, uh, the idea of having a domicile like this, I think, is attractive. Yeah, we, uh, me and my wife definitely looked at that too. It, uh, you know, it turns out with two toddlers, not the easiest to just randomly take them to a, another place to spend multiple nights. Uh, so it all uh, works out there. In a blog post today, Lyft announced that it will be suspending ride hailing operations in California as of 11:59 p.m. Pacific time on August 20th, aka tonight. That move came after a state judge ruled that a service must that the services must reclassify their drivers as employees rather than independent contractors in accordance with AB5. But wait, there's more. Beep, 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 beep. Just before the show, a California appeals court extended the length of, of, uh, of the time that Uber and Lyft have to comply with this order. The temporary reprieve grants Uber and Lyft until 5 p.m. Pacific time on August 25th at the soonest, although it might stretch as long as October, depending on a few factors, to file written statements agreeing to expedited procedures stated in the order, including a new timeline and sworn statements saying the companies have plans to reshape their business model if their ballot initiative, Prop 22, which would exempt ride sharing and food delivery gig workers from AB5 fails in November. In response, Uber and Lyft have both said they will not shut down tonight and indeed play this out until their stay expires. <laughs> you know, this is interesting because right after that initial ruling, I believe it was Judge Shulman rule, like initially said, no, you can't have a, we can't further stay the enforcement of this order any further. And it's interesting, you know, uh, uh, Lyft seemingly calling everybody's bluff, playing a game of chicken. 
and seems like either they either they knew something in their their legal filing would have already been effective or were just kind of confident uh, that uh, that it would be an effective play, kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, getting to uh, to eat their cake on this one. I don't know if it is chicken. It certainly mm. looks like it. And <laughs> certainly in the court of public opinion, the rubber was about to meet the road, pun intended, in terms of uh, how the public would react to not having the option to access a Lyft ride share. Uh, people who drive uh, would have uh, their own reactions to it. But you could read this as Lyft just saying, look, we, we genuinely don't believe that our business can operate if we have to categorize. I mean, the, the idea of Lyft, but with employees is simply a different company. Like that, that's just not what Lyft is. Lyft can't operate like that. And so if that's the case, then we do need to uh, pack up our tent and leave. I, I think that this was them complying. Uh, of, you know, I have no official well, sources on this, but that's the sense I've gotten anecdotally around the company. Uh, I, I really just... I just hope that this just goes to November 2nd. Look, we, we, we understand that this is going to be a thing, but uh, if you support AB5, I don't know if you want them going away before November 3rd. I think you want people not liking Uber and Lyft while still using Uber and Lyft, because if they go away, at least as this is what we have seen in other cities, people tend to have warmer feelings. Absence makes the heart grow fonder and uh, pressure on the government builds. Yeah, and and I kind of think that's the silver lining. You know, to your point, Lyft was was going to be suspending service to be in compliance with the ruling um, going forward. Uh, but I, I also think they had not a ton to lose, I think, by that. Because like you said, if they're off, uh, you know, people will recognize the launch of a bunch of unemployed, angry drivers that, you know, theoretically might, you know, appear on the local news or something like that. But then also, you know, the the other issue is that all of the their ride hailing revenue is massively down um, since the start of lockdowns. And I don't know if that's, you know, I haven't seen their, the latest financial. So I don't know if that's slightly recovered or they're seeing a slight uptick in that. But that business is so way down and they wouldn't have been giving up any of their other business. It was just the ride hailing business. Right. So you still had you know, your scooter rentals, your rent car rental service, uh, their bike service, all those other services would still have been in operation yeah, as well. But that's, that's not, Lyft is not in the delivery game. Yeah. Uber is, Uber would have kept delivering food. Uh, and while those other businesses, the bikes and the scooters are, those are ancillary. The, mm -hmm. the Lyft is for real, for real in trouble. Yeah, uh, most definitely. Inter uh, yeah, interesting, uh, you know, kind of seeing in Europe, we've seen Just Eat Takeaway, their CEO kind of saying that he wants to to get ahead of this reclassification thing. And they recently uh, right, just bought Grubhub. So seeing if that might have uh, some influence down the road, they didn't say they were going to be doing it immediately. Uh, but seeing if, if you know, I know Uber is very fond of talking about their third way in this whole thing, if uh, if maybe there'll be some other kind of opinions about that going forward. Uh, next up here, uh, Facebook announced it expanded its dangerous individuals and organizations policy to address organizations it deems as posing a significant threat to public safety, but does not meet the standard of being a dangerous organization that are banned from the platform entirely. Under this policy, Facebook will restrict the spread of content from Facebook pages, groups, and Instagram accounts linked to the groups and remove them if they identify discussions specifically related to potential violence. As part of the expanded policy, Facebook removed 790 groups and 100 pages linked to the QAnon conspiracy theory, blocked 300 hashtags, and removed 1,500 advertisements. An additional uh, 1,950 groups, 440 pages, and more than 10,000 Instagram accounts linked to QAnon have currently been restricted from spreading the content and may be removed if they are reviewed, or upon further review, I should say. Facebook also removed 980 groups, 520 pages, and restricted 1,400 related hashtags linked to U.S.-based US militia groups and offline anarchist groups, some of which Facebook says identified as Antifa. Uh, we actually, actually have a few stories like this, so we're going to bundle them all together. Back in June, Reddit announced that its own change in hate speech policy had banned over 2,000 subreddits, and now the company has announced that they've seen an 18% reduction in users posting hateful content compared to the two weeks prior. It also gave some details about hate speech content on the platform. Subreddits banned in June were viewed by an estimated uh, 360, uh, 365,000 users each day. Overall, hateful content amounted to 0.2% of total content posted each day. 
and with most of that left in the comments uh, and accounted for 0.16 of total views. Overall, 8% of potentially hateful content was reported by users with 30% of potentially hateful content removed each day by moderators and automated systems. And not to be left out, TikTok uh, added uh, prohibitions against hate speech in its community guidelines all the way back in January, starting at the year. Now, for the first time, TikTok has shared details of its content takedowns for those violations, announcing that it removed 380,000 videos and 64,000 comments in the U.S. for breaking its hate speech rules, as well as banning 1,300 users. You know, so, Justin, we have these all. I don't think we're necessarily coordinated. Uh, I think the Facebook one has gotten the most uh, uh, press here. Just, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of, yes, the, they're, yes, the biggest yes. they're the biggest platform. Hey, do I hear a Sarah Lane uh, joining us? I don't know if Sarah, oh, no, no, can, if Sarah can hear us, so we will see. Sarah can hear us. So Sarah, what, Sarah's what, trying to get on here. What is interesting to me is seeing three different companies, uh, different approaches to this. And, I, I you know, it's, it's interesting to break that down. I mean, this is a, it seems like a very typical Facebook move in that it seemingly satisfies no one and makes everyone mad at the, like I, Facebook's content moderation, you know, uh, Justin, you have famously dubbed, uh, you know, Porter to hell, hashtag hell portal uh, in, in other areas. And I think this kind of falls in that, in that same vein. They're trying to, it seems like they're trying to make, uh, be transparent about it, uh, uh, put that out front and, and release these statistics. Um, but I don't know if opening up to discussion of potential violence uh, will will truly make anyone happy. It, it seems like there's a lot of gray area there for sure. We're going to get into another story that uh, uh, factors into what people think about this and exactly how they believe it shapes political conversation in our main topic. But let's just say when I look at this report, I don't know what to make of these numbers. I honestly don't know. Are these numbers a lot? Are they a little considering the volume of what Facebook does? Uh, I don't particularly know exactly what, uh, uh, you know, the, you know, what is a, a acceptable QAnon group? What is an unacceptable QAnon group? Uh, what is an acceptable Antifa group? What is a unacceptable Antifa group? Uh, I think that a lot of this is feel good in the Reddit stuff as well where they can say look we're doing a thing but it's 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 i don't know really what it means i i honestly don't i yeah i almost think as in the reddit case very bizarre i mean i'm sure they're being forthright with with what they're putting out there certainly but like saying it's down 18 percent that is better than saying it increased certainly but like 18 percent to me is not a huge windfall when it comes to a decrease in hate speech it does also though back up when they said because when they shut down those 2000 subreddits i remember very distinctly they said these are very you know uh outside of one very once prominent one a lot of these were not uh, highly trafficked anyway i mean 365,000 total views a day is not like a ton when it comes to facebook or reddit or anything like that altogether um, and, and, you know, certainly a very analytical approach to that, that to me, t at least that gives me some context for where they see this problem in the scope of their total platform. Like to me that, that those numbers are more meaningful to me than throwing out a bunch of, of names of groups. And I have no idea how many videos are posted on TikTok. I mean, certainly 1300 users does not seem like a lot of users to be impacted, uh, by, by hate speech policy on TikTok's part for sure. Well, and TikTok is a different situation since they do a lot more curation mm -hmm. of uh, at least the big mega uh, uh, stars on their platform. The, the, the For You page is something that they have a lot more control over. Uh, I mean, and then again, we also don't even know where the TikTok of it all necessarily <laughs> lands uh, these days. But uh, writ large transparency is good so i don't want to ding them for being not perfect all at once but that being said i kind of feel like there just needs to be a daily report with a lot of these sites and we need to see a lot more about exactly why they're banned and who they're banned and and i think that there's other uh, uh recourses that people should have to say wait why why did this happen to me and and what status do i have on the platform yeah most definitely all right, and remember, you can get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes. You can subscribe at dailytechheadlines.com. All right, so Justin, we have a new survey from Pew Research Center. You may well, have heard on, of wait, them. Before, before we get into this new survey from Pew Research, I think we also have a Sarah Lane. Sarah, are you there? We do. Do you hey, hear me? Yes. We do. Good. We can hear you. We can a hear wild you. Sarah Lane emerges. I am so sorry, everybody. It has been... <laughs> 
it has been a day. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Mildly. Um, and I don't hear myself, but if you can hear me, great, good, good we stuff. Can, yes. No, no, no. We can, we can definitely hear you. And, uh, that is all that matters. So I, I'm sorry to step on your, uh, read there, Rich. What, what happened with Pew Research? <laughs> well, I, I do definitely want to hear the dulcet tones of Sarah Lane's uh, reaction to this because a new survey from Pew Research Center centered around if Americans think the social media platform, if social media platforms censor political speech and whether they think that social media companies should actually be doing that. Overall, 73 percent of Americans think that at least it's somewhat likely that social media platforms censor political viewpoints, up one percent from a similar 2018 survey. This majority spans across political affiliations with 59 percent of uh, Democrat leaning respondents. Uh, finding it at least somewhat likely compared to 90% of Republican-leaning respondents, but both of them a majority. Some uh, que uh, some questions did fall more along partisan lines, like whether respondents approved of social media platforms labeling posts by elected officials and ordinary users as inaccurate. But while uh, partisan splits could still be seen in other questions, majorities across political affiliations shared a lack of confidence in social media platforms to label inaccurate content. Um, so it, it's it's interesting that everyone is kind of uh, 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 kind of dubious about the uh, or, or, or is, is, is has some sort of agreement that there is some sort of political censorship going on on these platforms. Uh, it, certainly, a majority of Americans seem to think that, at least according to the survey. Um, you know, Justin, uh, kind of what do you make about a little bit more of the particulars in terms of confidence of of if those social media platforms should be then involved in you know labeling content. Oh, I got thoughts on thoughts on thoughts, Rich, but I want to go to Sarah first. Uh, uh, Sarah, uh, what, what do you think about this? Well, so, um, you know, my, 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 my main takeaway is always, okay, it's not so much about what is being censored. It's how the platforms are censoring things and how they may be, you know, doing things differently than their neighbor. Um, you know, and when I talk about platforms, it's like Facebook, Twitter, you know, the big guys. So at this point, you know, I don't, you know, I, I, I really don't want to, you know, make little of what is being centered. But at this point, it's, it's more to me about how are these networks doing this? How, how, how are they managing something that is, you know, on, on a very large scale, like kind of a bad thing. Like I, it's, it's very messy. Well, let, let's, let's break it down to its elemental core politics in general. And I don't mean what our modern political world is. I mean, as old as ancient Greece, right. Is about organization not only identifying people that you have a like-minded thought process with, so you might share news that is relevant to you, but also in terms of elections, identifying the people that are most likely to vote for you, identifying the hardcore of those that want to help you get elected, that want to help you spread the word. Mm -hmm. Building a volunteer team is crucial because while we look at you know billion dollar campaigns for president, by and large, people are running uh, small little campaigns to get elected on a shoestring budget. You need volunteers. Social media became an immediate way that you could do that. It was very easy to identify yourself. It was very easy to provide a place where you could say, oh, you want to keep in touch? Go to this page. Go to this group. So the the, the fact that political thought and political discourse and political campaigns have used social media inherently is not uh, uh, surprising. What is surprising is the fact that we've never really untangled that totally radioactive element <laughs> from a large part of our uh, a large part of our, our modern discourse from everything else on social media. We've never really detangled it from the the uh, uh, food pics and and the cat pics. And, uh, uh, <laughs> right, can, right. I just rewatched yeah. Friends. Like this is all in the same bucket, which means that something that I think should probably have different rules to it, something that should be moderated differently on on some level is is just kind of thrown into the hopper and, and that then coincides with long-standing trends in general, conservatives believe that the uh, uh, that liberal operators in media have censored them forever. They shape the news 
based on their personal beliefs, and that's what that is. And that's as true as it was in, in the 1950s when it was mag magazine and newspaper editors as it is now when, uh, uh, when, when social media platforms uh, that are largely based in a very liberal area of the country uh, – you know, are are censoring or deplatforming people that conservatives believe are having it done unfairly. So, well, so Justin, I mean, you yeah. know, not <laughs> not to throw you under the bus too much, but what would you think uh, this would be? What what would be the better way to approach this? <sighs> well, <laughs> I, I mean, I think that there are there are large scale issues. I think with the unfettered growth of Twitter and Facebook specifically mm -hmm. and the lack of moderation control. I think when you look at Twitter and you realize, oh wait, this is just a wild message board without mods. The only mods that exist are admins for the platform itself. Uh, then some of the insanity sort of makes a lot more sense. And that's before you get to the point where we have an algorithm supercharging certain content that is uh, more shareable or actionable that often happens to be the most incendiary uh, that gets your adrenaline running, uh, which by the way, right. politics is also really good at incendiary content mm -hmm. that gets your adrenaline running. Uh, so I, I don't know if this is a situation where we're ever gonna get around is political speech censored? Your point, Sarah, I do think is on the, on the prescriptive end more what we need to understand. And that is, why is it censored? How is it censored? And that being done in a transparent manner for which we can all understand. For example, on Twitter a couple of days ago, there's a satirical website uh, uh, that has a Twitter account, like all websites do, uh, <laughs> Babylon B. And it's more of a conservative leaning onion kind of uh, uh, outlet. It's very funny and it got suspended. And now it was only suspended for what I could tell about 30 minutes and then the account came back on. But in that moment, you know, a lie races around the world before the truth has a chance to put on its pants. And this wasn't even a lie. This was a, just a hiccup, a thing. Uh, but free the bee was trending uh, uh, past that because the prime was uh, the pump was primed for they finally came after the most innocuous conservative outlet <laughs> uh, like that was that was the story. So I don't know if again this stuff being censored I think is probably a benefit. You want some level of control from the platform that that shapes their product. Mm. But how they're doing it and why they're doing it and the political splits on exactly how much, I think that will only continue until, and hopefully this doesn't reach the end resolution, eventually each party will lose every once in a while and then they will get very <laughs> upset that they lost because of these platforms because politics loves to find scapegoats for why people <laughs> lost that don't involve <laughs> the candidates uh, or the people that worked on the campaigns. And they're eventually going to find some way or reason to crack down on these sites from a governmental level, which I think would be bad. Well, the conversation continues. And obviously, if you have thoughts, you can always participate in our subreddit, submit stories and vote on them at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. Rich Straffolino, who's in yes. the mailbag? Well, I, I would love to tell you, Sarah, uh, we have this amazing email uh, it's coming to us, and of course now I can't read it because the cell is moved. Uh, it's from Arthur. He's Canadian, uh, and he says, Being a Windows, formerly DOS user over the majority of my tech life, I was uh, once used to purchasing software from local stores on disk sourced from a variety of publishers without a guarantee that the software will necessarily work as expected. In those days, there was always the idea that in the back of my mind that a virus or other malware could have infected the disk at some point, but doing the travel from the developer to my hands. With the advent of the internet and centralized app stores, consumers were offered the implied security that software is being downloaded has been vetted by an entity with financial interest in the user having a good device experience. Somehow the idea of the store taking a cut has become 
icky. I wonder if the public has lost sight of the value of the store. One question is, once the store is established, what is the real cost of upkeep uh, to the entity running the store? Does Apple really need to take a 30% cut to cover its costs? Of course, sideloading is a possibility in most ecosystems, Microsoft, Android, Mac computers, for example. So I don't see a problem with the developer, Epic in this case, offering a lower price on their own website compared to a higher price on the platform store. Users willingly take the risk of leaving the safety of the store should be able to access a factory direct price. However, it also makes sense that Apple and Google remove the app when the developer actively redirects users from a trusted store to the independent website. For Bursley yours, Arthur. So it, oh, it, Arthur. Well, thank you so much for uh, uh, <laughs> we we appreciate your your verboseness. Um, this is actually a really good. It's an interesting uh, you know idea of uh, you know back in the day. Yeah, you go to a store, you buy a piece of software, you know that the store is you know trustworthy, and you feel good about that. We are not in those days anymore. <laughs> you know, everything is all you know in in various you know app stores, uh, you know, uh, Apple or Google or you know uh, the like, and that is actually a really good point, I think, because in 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 a certain sense, as Arthur was saying, it's like, well, you you're kind of paying for that vetting. You're paying for that vetting that that company is doing on your behalf before you end up buying anything because you're not going to do that. I don't know. What do you think? As with our previous discussion, I think perhaps transparency, uh, uh, you know, if, if it's the case that it is extremely expensive to vet all of these apps, they have, you know, million, uh, hundreds of thousands, not millions of apps on the app store. Um, you know, I'm sure that is not a, a cheap thing to do. Uh, but I, I, you know, I, I think the perception is that, uh, you know, Apple is certainly making a tidy amount of revenue uh, off of, of the app store. And, you know, uh, where if that's just pure profit off the top, then I think that's where some of the companies get a little uh, feel a little icky, as Arthur said. Well, let's shout out patrons at our master and grandmaster levels, including Johnny Hernandez, Ragnall Vermidal, and Bjorn Andre. Also, thank you, thank you, thank you to Justin Robert Young for being with us today. Justin, you are a busy man. Let <laughs> folks know where they can keep up with your work. Well, politics is blooming, Sarah, and I am there to pick and trim the roses and present them to you each and every night of these conventions, as I have been throughout this week for the Democrats, and I will be again tonight at uh, twitch.tv slash Justin R. Young. I will be next week for the uh, Republican convention. Uh, that is Monday through Thursday. And of course... I'm also on the Politics, Politics, Politics podcast. You can get that at politicspoliticspolitics.com or anywhere that you find podcasts in general. <laughs> Excellent. You can always support our show at any level by going to dailytechnewsshow.com slash Patreon. Thank you so much in advance. Thank you so much to my cohorts for you know, helping me along this, this week. It's been kind of weird, <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but I love y'all. Um, and if you, if you don't have a mask, maybe you have a mask, but if you don't have one and you want one, we have masks in our DTNS store. And now you can go to dailytechnewsshow.com slash store, get yourself a mask. Um, and thank you so much in advance uh, for anybody who has some thoughts on feelings and everything else about the show. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We are live Monday through Friday for 30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC. You can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We are to back tomorrow. Go ahead. All right, we're back tomorrow with Rob Dunwood and Len Peralta. See you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Frog Pants Network. Get more shows like this at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>